Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum's Exploring Space Lecture Series for 2023. I'm Ross Irwin, geologist and chair of the Museum's Center for Earth and Planetary Studies, where we study the geologic processes that have shaped the planets and moons of the solar system. Science fiction gives us a vision of human life throughout the solar system and the galaxy, but few worlds are truly habitable for people. The 2023 Exploring Space Lecture Series examines the realities of life and habitability for life in space. This story began with remote bases on the Earth and then looked outward to the International Space Station, future bases on the Moon and Mars, and tonight, the challenges of life on more distant worlds. This lecture series is made possible by the generous support of United Launch Alliance and Aerojet Rocketdyne. Our distinguished guest speaker tonight is Dr. Amanda Hendricks, senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson, Arizona. As a graduate student and postdoctoral researcher at the University of Colorado, she learned ultraviolet spectroscopy and began a career investigating solar system surfaces, largely airless bodies, in the ultraviolet. She then spent 12 years at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, progressing from a science planner on the Cassini mission to Saturn to deputy project scientist before moving to the Planetary Science Institute in 2012. She is a co-investigator on the Cassini UVIS and the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter LAMP instruments. Dr. Hendricks is director and principal investigator of the NASA Toolbox for Exploration team. She co-authored Beyond Earth, Our Path to a New Home in the Planets, published by Penguin Random House in 2016. Her next adventure is on the Europa Clipper mission to Jupiter's moon Europa. Dr. Hendricks received a Bachelor of Science in Aeronautical Engineering from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and an MS and PhD in Aerospace Engineering Sciences from the University of Colorado at Boulder. She has received the Jet Propulsion Laboratory Lou Allen Award for Excellence and numerous Group Achievement Awards for her work on the Cassini, Galileo, and Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter missions. The minor planet 6813 Amanda Hendricks was named after her in 2018. You'll have to tell me how that gets done because I, I really. After Dr. Hendricks speaks, we'll have time for questions and answers, so please feel free to submit your questions online or ask them here in the museum's planetarium. I'm very grateful to our sponsors, Aerojet Rocketdyne and United Launch Alliance, for their support for this series. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight to learn about the habitability of worlds in the outer solar system. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. And I'd like to thank Ross and his colleagues for inviting me. And also, I'd like to thank our, our um, sponsors, ULA and Rocketdyne Aerojet, for, for um, enabling this um, function. This has been a terrific uh, lecture series, and I'm really pleased and honored to be part of it. So let's start off talking about habitability in the outer solar system. And we'll start by, oh, here's my, here's my first slide. Uh, habitability in the outer solar system. What is the definition of habitability? I like to think of habitability as the ability of an environment to support life. Um, and when we're talking about life here in, in this um, discussion, we'll talk about um, the most simple, basic forms of life, um, just microorganisms, all the way up to complex life and humans and animals. We think about three basic requirements for, for all those kinds of life. The first one is liquid water. Liquid water acts as a solvent for a lot of processes and enables key uh, chemical reactions to occur. You can imagine uh, that in conditions here on Earth, at our location in the solar system, that water is liquid. Um, and, it's, and it's also, of course, um, present in frozen state. But um, Earth's temperatures enable liquid water quite readily. But there are places in other parts of the solar system that you can imagine where other molecules that might be, for instance, frozen here on Earth or in gas phase, uh, might be liquids and act as solvents for life elsewhere. 
but uh, we're going to focus here on liquid life, life forms that uh, fo um, require liquid water. Uh, the second requirement is nutrients. And I've got a picture here of food that, you know, you and I think of as nutrients. But really, when we're talking about uh, the most basic forms of life, uh, we're talking about the um, elemental needs. And we think of them um, uh, as elements of carbon, uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, schnapps. And these are, these are the elements that are required by life as we know it here. And then finally, life requires an energy source, such as the energy derived from the sun or a star or some sort of chemical um, derived uh, energy. We know here on Earth that um, photosynthesis, solar derived photosynthesis is uh, uh, an important um, energy uh, in, um, to um, produce food, nutrients, for, for a lot of different life forms. In addition to these three basics, it's important to consider a couple of other components that life requires. Uh, the first of them is time. It does take life, when we think about life getting started on Earth, it takes a little time to kind of take hold. We have the first hints here on Earth of life having taken hold um, only about, maybe only about a half to one billion years after Earth was formed, after the beginning of the solar system. So this is maybe some three and a half, uh, th um, three and a half billion years ago. We have um, clues from fossils, clues from geochemical evidence uh, that life had taken hold. So. 500 million years might sound like a pretty long time, but it's actually relatively early in the whole history of uh, the planet to have taken hold. And yet, it's a significant amount of time. So it's kind of like, um, it takes a long time, and yet it's surprising when you think about how old Earth and the solar system are, that how early on Earth, Earth uh, life seemed to have taken hold. And then the other important factor is protection. So we here on Earth are protected with our atmosphere um, and our magnetosphere, which I'll talk more about later, uh, from really harmful radiation that's out in the solar system. Um, there's solar radiation, there's um, solar wind, energetic electrons and ions, there's galactic cosmic rays, these are damaging to life. We know that organics break down under different types of radiation. We know that we, um, even humans, are susceptible to UV radiation. Luckily here on uh, the surface of the Earth, you know, we have the ozone layer for the most part to um, kind of um, filter out a lot of that solar UV. But it's very damaging, the, uh, these types of radiation, to human tissue. So we need uh, time to get for life to take hold, and we also need protection once it has taken hold. But also I'm talking about, and I, and I want to make this clear, that we have basically one data point, right, for life, for understanding life. And that's he life here on Earth. And we recognize it's very variable, but we also recognize that we don't know all that there is to know about life on this planet at all. But we're looking for life elsewhere in the solar system based on what we understand about it um, from this one single data point. Okay, habitable zones for life. Um, life, we think, could have gotten started in the oceans here on Earth. Um, it, we, we know, we talked about how life requires liquid water and pretty much wherever we look on Earth where there's liquid water, there is life. Um, here on Earth, we have learned relatively recently that even at the seafloor, I mean, this was in the 70s, that these hydrothermal vents were discovered and found to be teeming with life. And these are areas where there is no sunlight. It's so deep on the ocean floor. And yet, um, there are uh, hydrothermal vents that are providing nutrients, they're providing um, 
you know, superheated hydrogen and methane and hydrogen sulfide. And uh, these are nutrients and it's also energy. So these um, microbes can use, instead of photosynthesis, they can use chemosynthesis to um, convert um, these nutrients into energy and survive. And so this makes us think, well, if there's liquid water anywhere else in the solar system, maybe they don't need the sun in order to survive. There, there could be life in those, in those liquid water zones that doesn't need um, solar. So that can kind of um, expand our horizons, you know, it, it, for looking for life. We, we used to think that the Earth is the Goldilocks zone for, for life, um, that Earth is of a temperature that we're the only place that has liquid water on the surface. We're not too hot like Venus. We're not too cold with no liquid water anymore like, like Mars. We're just right for life. But again, if there are places in the solar system with liquid water, maybe we don't even need that energy source from the sun. Maybe, maybe life can still survive there. So that opens up our, our space for looking for life. So where might we find life elsewhere? And this brings us to the concept of ocean worlds, which were theorized in as early as the early 1970s. Um, but these are bodies where we know that there are liquid layers, but they're not on the surface because generally the surfaces are exposed to space. There is no um, insulating atmosphere, and um, and it's very cold. But we know now that they have liquid oceans, liquid layers underneath their surfaces. And it was really that this. It was really back in the. 1990s that this field broke open with the Galileo mission and the studies of Europa. So um, here's Europa. It's one of the moons of Jupiter. It's about as big as our moon. Um, so it's about, uh, has a radius of about 1,560 kilometers. But it's an icy moon. We know that the surface is primarily composed of water ice. And we know that from ground-based uh, telescopic measurements. And yet, here on this image of uh, Europa, you can see that it doesn't really look like water ice. It looks like it's um, kind of got a lot of contaminants in it. And this has to do with the environment in which Europa orbits Jupiter. Um, this is a, a cartoon showing you that environment. So this is Jupiter. And it's demonstrating what a magnificently large magnetic field Jupiter has. Um, it's a big planet anyway, but it's got a magnetic field uh, generated by its uh, core, just like we have here on Earth, with a North Pole and a South Pole. But it's just such a big planet and such a strong field that it's very extended in size. So all of the moons that we talk about at Europa, uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, all orbit Jupiter within this giant magnetic field. And along with that giant magnetic field, um, along the field lines are electrons bouncing up and down. And these are electrons that are up to you know, hundreds of MeV, uh, very energetic. Um, and then ions generated from the volcanic moon Io. Um, so it's a very, very intense radiation environment. And so remember, I talked about radiation. Um, life um, is not too happy in a high radiation environment. But so when we think about Europa, we look at that surface and we understand the radiation um, environment in which Europa orbits Jupiter. And we think, OK, there's, not, there's probably not going to be life on the surface there. But one of the reasons I, sh I tell you this is because uh, this is why the surface probably looks like it does, with the coloration. This reddish uh, terrain that you see is probably the result of radiation um, because the um, magnetic field of Jupiter is sort of rotating um, with the planet itself and kind of moving past Europa as Europa orbits Jupiter. 
And, and so the surface is bombarded by all of these energetic particles. And it produces a darkening effect. And we don't actually understand this 100% yet. But it may have to do with some sort of activity on the surface also. And this activity is shown here in a couple of examples where you can see that the surface is obviously active in some way. So this, um, again, is an icy surface, but with this dark contaminant in it. But it's crisscrossed with fractures. And the reddish material often seems concentrated at those fractures. Um, the reddish material is concentrated in these places where the ice is broken up and jumbled. And we call it chaos terrain because it looks like something chaotic has gone on there. Um, there are areas like in that kind of top image where it looks like the surface has been broken up and it looks like icebergs. Those look like floating chunks of ice on some sort of maybe a mushy layer or maybe it used to be a liquid layer and it's frozen now. So these are, these are hints just from imaging uh, from the Galileo spacecraft that something seems to be going on underneath the surface of Europa or something has gone on in the recent past. And the clues, the really, the, the real kicker, <laughs> came from the Galileo mission. It came from the magnetometer. And this has to do with, this is kind of thanks to, back to Jupiter's magnetic field. So we talked about how it produces this uh, really intense radiation environment. But it also ended up being very helpful for us understanding the, the interior of Europa. Because Europa, or sorry, Jupiter's magnetic field is tilted by about 10 degrees uh, from its spin axis. So it's actually how Earth's is too. But um, so what happens is, is as Jupiter rotates, um, this, the magnetic field kind of rotates but kind of wobbles, if you can imagine that. And it takes about 11 hours for uh, a day on Jupiter is about 11 hours. So it spins in 11 hours. And so the magnetic equator, which is offset from the kind of geographic equator, is tilted. And it ends up tilting up and down like this. OK, on, so um, at time zero, it might be down here. At time five and a half hours, it's up here. And Europa and the other moons, in the meantime, are orbiting Jupiter in the equatorial plane. So this magnetic equator is kind of wobbling around them, if that makes sense. So this ends up uh, being very helpful because the magnetometer instrument on Galileo, let me go back and explain what happened. Galileo, uh, the, the spacecraft arrived at Jupiter and it orbited Jupiter but then it did many flybys of the moons. And uh, the magnetometer on board took measurements of the magnetic environment uh, at Europa on each of these Europa flybys. And the Europa flybys were done such that um, we were able to measure the magnetic environment when the magnetic field was at different orientations with respect to the moon. And that changing magnetic environment if you can imagine going to the airport, well, this was a little bit in the old days <laughs> when you used to have to walk through a, or when you go and you, you have to, um, you're going into a, you know, the capital and you have to, you know, put your wallet into the bucket and walk through the little um, gate. And that's a changing magnetic field that you're walking through. And if you leave your keys in your pocket, the alarm's gonna go off because the keys are conducting and so they're going to trigger the alarm. Well, just like your keys triggered the alarm, Europa triggered the magnetometer to say, there's a conducting something in there. Because that changing magnetic field induced a magnetic field in Europa. And after about three flybys in changing magnetic environments, it became clear that uh, the most reasonable answer was that that conducting environment, that conducting interior part of Europa was a layer of liquid salty water, a subsurface salty ocean. 
So this was really neat because, um, you know, I had um, just finished my PhD in 1996 when all of this was happening. And, you know, so I was kind of fresh out, but going, this is, a, this is really big. <laughs> this is the first time that an ocean world has actually been discovered. And um, so it was very, very exciting to be, you know, even witnessing that kind of firsthand. So Europa was the OG of the ocean worlds. Why does it happen? It happens because, primarily because of tidal heating. So Europa is orbiting Jupiter, which is a giant planet, very massive, lots of gravity, lots of tidal interactions, just like the Earth and the Moon have, except on a much greater scale. Um, so Jupiter pulls on Europa as Europa uh, orbits it. Um, it. It's a tidal interaction, a gravitational interaction, and it creates friction in, inside Europa, which creates heat, and um, you can see that we think that Europa's interior um, is largely kind of rocky, that brown stuff, and that rocky stuff is in contact with the blue layer, which is the liquid water, the ocean. So that rock um, is, gets hot from all that friction and all that tidal interaction, and that's what keeps that liquid water, that, that water layer actually liquid and keeps it from freezing. But it's actually more than this, because uh, the other moons are in orbital resonance with Europa. So um, Io, which orbits interior to Europa, and Ganymede, which orbits exterior to Europa, they're in orbital resonance. So uh, every couple of times that Europa goes around, um, Ganymede goes around once. And so that's an extra gravitational pull. And what this does is it keeps Europa's orbit slightly eccentric so that it's constantly being flexed just a little bit and constantly creating heat in there. It doesn't really ever uh, allow it to cool down uh, fully so that that ocean can freeze. So um, this is the key to maintaining um, a liquid ocean is to have a massive planet <laughs> with, uh, that has a lot of gravity and a lot of tidal interactions and also to have um, orbital resonances so that, um, that or your orbit stays eccentric um, and you can constantly have that, um, that flexing of your interior. Um, so this is what we now think uh, the interior of Europa looks like. So the surface has got some level of contaminants on it. It's not uh, fresh water ice. But below that is an icy shell. It's probably, you know, somewhere between 15 and 20 kilometers thick. Some people think it's on the thinner side. Some people think it's on the thicker side. Um, and then it overlies a liquid water salty ocean, uh, which is probably somewhere between uh, 100 and 200 kilometers thick, pretty much. And there, there may be, there is um, likely some sort of communication between that water and the, um, the ice shell and the surface um, that can then present itself as some of these surface features that we talked about initially. And there may even be plume activity, so cracks in the surface where ocean material is allowed to vent out. There's been hints about uh, plume activity from Hubble Space Telescope data, um, and we will really need to go to Europa and find out if this plume activity is really happening and what it's telling us about the ocean. And um, Actually, this is what I want to tell you about Juno. Juno is orbiting, this is a mission that's orbiting um, Jupiter right now. It recently did this really awesome close flyby of Europa. And th so this is our most recent look at the um, surface of Europa. And you can just see how tortured this surface is. I mean, it is just um, warped and fractured and discolored 
and there's pits and spots. And um, I'm really, really excited to go back with the next mission to Europa, which will be launched next year in October. And that's Europa Clipper. And Europa Clipper will be Galileo-like in that it will orbit Jupiter, but then do um, lots of Europa flybys so that we can understand this ocean and understand the habitability. Um, so this is a picture in the middle, at the, at the bottom here, of Europa actually, or sorry, Clipper actually, in, um, you know, being built, being assembled at JPL. And again, it'll get launched next year. Also, our European colleagues uh, at European Space Agency have the JUICE mission, which is Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. That was just launched a couple of months ago in April. It's on its way. Um, Clipper will get launched on a Falcon Heavy, and it'll actually get out to Jupiter first, but these two missions will be in the Jupiter system simultaneously, and we'll be able to do synergistic science and understand Europa and the other moons. So that's really exciting. So stay tuned for that. But we also think from magnetometer data, again, that Ganymede and Callisto also have subsurface moons. They, um, you know, again, these were clues from the um, changing magnetic field and the magnetometer. Ganymede has the orbital resonances. Um, Callisto probably has a subsurface ocean too, but importantly, we don't think that these two oceans uh, have a rocky seafloor. So these oceans um, have, are in contact, kind of sandwiched between two ice layers. So they're probably not going to be as long-lived. They're probably not going to uh, be as potentially habitable as Europa's uh, ocean is going to be. Let's go to Enceladus because we've got these large worlds. I mean, the, you, I should say Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto are all, you know, kind of Earth moon sized. Ganymede's actually much larger than Earth's moon. It's the biggest moon in the solar system. But um, they've all got subsurface oceans. And Enceladus came as a surprise because it's really small. Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. And um, this is an image from the Voyager spacecraft back in the early 80s. Um, which showed us that it's an icy moon, a lot of water ice, um, and it's cratered, but not saturated with craters like Earth's moon is. Um, but there are these entire vast regions that did not appear at the time anyway to have any craters. And uh, a lack of craters on an airless body like this is is generally consistent with being geologically young. So perhaps some geologic process is going on to erase the craters because um, you know, usually you, you uh, have a surface out there just exposed to me meteors and micrometeoroid bombardment and get uh, cratered. But it is such a small body um, that geologic activity would be a surprise because we tend to think of geologic bodies that are, bodies that are small as losing um, a lot of their internal heat relatively quickly, and then there's no heat to drive um, geology. So Enceladus was an interesting case with the um, Cassini mission. When it got there in 2004, um, it, it showed us that, that Enceladus is, in fact, geologically active, and I'll tell you the story quickly. But first of all, I just want to em emphasize uh, how small Enceladus is there up at the top compared to, you know, Europa there over on the left and Ganymede at the lower right, for instance. Um, when Cassini, which uh, I worked on a lot, as you, as you may have heard, and it was a really, really great mission, um, one of the things that we wanted to understand was why Enceladus orbit seems to be centered on the densest part of the E-ring. So you can see Enceladus there in the lower panel um, orbiting outside the main rings but centered on this kind of fuzzy looking diffuse ring which is the E-ring. Um, again if it's such a small world why would it be, what, what's the connection with the E-ring? We wanted to know that. We also wanted to know 
why it didn't seem to have any craters, at least on part of it. And when we got there, we found out that it looked like this, at least at the South Pole, that it's like, again, this tortured looking surface, warped, um, crater free, I mean, this is much uh, higher resolution now than we got with Voyager. We could see that there's very few craters and um, significant fractures. And this is centered right at the South Pole, by the way, here, in between those four stripes at the bottom. We called them the tiger stripes. And again, the magnetometer, which is very interesting, uh, provided the first clues. But Saturn does, is not, um, the magnetic field is not tilted with respect to the spin pole like we had at Jupiter. So we couldn't do the same trick with the wobbly magnetic field. But what the magnetometer told us was that um, due to, um, you know, the first fairly close flyby, this is early in 2005, uh, the magnetometer results seemed to indicate that something was going on, like kind of a, a local atmosphere at Enceladus. And I worked on the ultraviolet instrument, and we had done a stellar occultation, which is a sensitive way of measuring uh, for a thin atmosphere. And we had already done the stellar occultation, and we said, oh, no, there's no atmosphere at Enceladus. Our occultation went right uh, th you know, through the equatorial region, and we didn't see any atmosphere. And the magnetometer team came back and said, oh, it's only a south polar atmosphere. <laughs> so you wouldn't have seen it in your stellar rock. And um, so the next flyby uh, went by the south pole. And sure enough, um, there was a, a hot spot at the south pole uh, measured by the thermal camera. It was. Um, about 85, 95 Kelvin, uh, which is minus 300 Fahrenheit, so not very hot to you and me, but much hotter than it was expected to be, and very odd that it was at the South Pole. And nearly all the other instruments on uh, the Cassini spacecraft during this flyby also sensed uh, something unique associated with a uh, South Polar atmosphere, or what we then recognized as a plume. And then later on, we, ac we actually got images um, that showed this plume at the South Pole. This is backlit, so it's a high phase image, and so what we're looking at here are the actual grains coming out of the plume. Here's another little um, animation to show you. Um, this plume at the South Pole made up of these jets that are all kind of um, sourced along those fractures at the South Pole. And here's another image of Enceladus. As we learned, this plume activity is indeed actually the source of the E-ring. So even though it's such a small body, and we really were surprised to find out how active it was, it turns out it really is the source of the E-ring. Now what it is, is a subsurface ocean sourcing that plume, sourcing the jets, and uh, it's mainly water. So what we measure is water vapor, water particles, and uh, we know from gravitational measurements um, that it's actually a global subsurface ocean. The, um, the ice shell probably varies in thickness between maybe, you know, five to a couple tens of uh, kilometers. Um, and the ocean itself might be some tens of kilometers thick. And we know from Cassini measurements what the ocean uh, composition is. Um, we didn't go there planning on it, but we got a, some really good measurements to help us understand what it is. We know that it's primarily water, but also there's um, some levels of methane, some simple organics, some um, CO2 and methane, a little bit of um, ammonia. We also know that there are salts in the ocean. And we know now, uh, this is a brand new measurement from uh, Cassini data, that there's um, sodium phosphates. 
And so this means that all of these components in the plume tell us that this is a habitable ocean. So this plume is sourced from the ocean and uh, we've got all of the schnapps um, to, to help support life. Um, so this now, we really think that Enceladus is probably the most habitable place other than Earth in the solar system and probably our best bet in terms of going after um, a search for life. Interestingly, really interestingly, one of the components uh, we know now uh, in the plume is um, molecular hydrogen. And we also know that there are these nanograins, these nanosilicates, that uh, both of these components, the molecular hydrogen, the nanosilicates, both um, are clues to likely uh, high temperature rock water interactions. So perhaps hydrothermal vents uh, at the surface of the ocean, at the seafloor of Enceladus's ocean, um, like um, shown in the graphic at the right. This is an artist's conception of what might be happening uh, within the Enceladus ocean uh, as compared with what does happen in Earth's ocean. So this is a really exciting habitable environment. So we talked about Europa uh, and its ocean and Clipper will go to understand how habitable that ocean might be. Enceladus's ocean we think uh, we know already um, is probably is probably habitable, at least it has all of the elements of habitability. Um, but what we've been focusing on here so far is kind of microbial life and where might microbial life uh, be able to survive and where might we discover it in the solar system. Um, but let's think, let's kind of extend our, open our minds a little bit and think about where, where might humans be able to live in the solar system. Humans need, need those three basic ingredients for life, the liquid water, the nutrients, the energy. Uh, but we also need air to breathe, right? Uh, we need atmospheric pressure. You know, we're used to living at one bar of atmospheric pressure here on the surface. And when um, humans have gone to the moon, they've been in pressurized spacesuits and they're uh, in pressurized spacesuits when they get launched off the planet. Um, so it's, um, we, we like atmospheric pressure and we also really need that uh, radiation shielding. Uh, and we need other stuff too, like we need reasonable temperatures and we need um, you know, food and water and we need all of our stuff and our infrastructure if we're going to set up camp somewhere. Um, and there's not very many places really that I can think of in the solar system where this can happen, except for one, which is Titan. And Titan, like Enceladus, is a moon of Saturn, but it's the biggest moon of Saturn. Um, and the special thing about Titan is what you can see here. It looks like an orange ball. Uh, because it is covered in quite a dense atmosphere. It's a dense atmosphere of mainly nitrogen with a little methane and some trace amounts of other um, species in there. Um, and there's a lot of atmospheric chemistry that goes on that creates aerosols and hazes, which makes it so that we cannot see th with our eyes down to the surface kind of like it is uh, out there right now with all the haze. <laughs> um, but if you uh, look through with your infrared goggles like we did with Cassini, we can see, we can probe through that atmosphere and see the surface and see how fascinating it looks. It's very um, variable. It actually looks kind of Earth-like, except that those are not continents that you see. They're just... Um, variable regions across the surface, different types of terrains that we still have a lot to learn about. Um, Cassini took a long infrared instrument and also radar to be able to peer through that thick atmosphere, which we knew was there um, before, and we wanted to be able to see what that surface is like. 
And we also took along a probe. Uh, it was the Huygens probe, and I'll show you an image from the Huygens probe in a bit. Um, and Titan is, is an ocean world, too, actually. It is, um, it's got a subsurface ocean um, that we'll talk about in a minute. But the most remarkable thing that I want to talk about again is the atmosphere. This is a beautiful Cassini image of the upper atmosphere. It shows some of these layers due to chemistry going on and hazes. Um, and I really would like to try to stress to you how remarkable this is because the other moons that we've talked about today, Europa, we've talked about Earth's moon, we've talked about Enceladus and Ganymede and Callisto, none of these moons have atmospheres. Um, they have exospheres, which means that they have very, very, very thin atmospheres. But um, the fact that Titan has this nitrogen atmosphere uh, if you were to stand on the surface, you would feel just a little more surface pressure than we feel here. It's, got, it's at one and a half bars on the surface. Um, and that is remarkable. It's the only moon with that kind of atmosphere, which really makes you wonder, where did, why does it have that atmosphere? How is that sourced and maintained? Um, so a lot of people want to understand where that atmosphere comes from, but what I also think of is, well, wow, there are, there's no energetic particles hitting that surface. Anything that's on that surface is not going to experience the radiation environment of space. And that makes it very unique. That makes it very Earth-like. <clears throat> Titan's an ocean world, as I mentioned. This is what we think that the interior structure looks like. Rocky interior, then an ice layer, then the liquid ocean, and then it's covered by an ice layer. Um, we'll talk more about that. So uh, Titan's subsurface ocean likely does not have a rocky seafloor, again, like Enceladus's or Europa's. Um, but the surface may be habitable in some ways. It certainly is Earth-like. It's the most Earth-like place in the solar system. Thanks to the atmosphere, there are seasons, well, thanks to the orbit, there are seasons, but thanks to the atmosphere, there's weather and seasonal-related weather. There's wind, and so there are sand dunes on Titan, just like we have here on Earth, except the, the main difference is that uh, there are not silicate sands on Titan. There's hydrocarbon sands. So I mentioned the atmosphere and the chemistry and the haze layers. All that atmospheric chemistry results in complex organics being produced. And uh, they tend to produce rain, and they also tend to settle out on the surface in different forms. And so we end up having hydrocarbon sands on the surface and hydrocarbon other types of materials uh, elsewhere on the surface. So the, the, the um, sand dunes, the hydrocarbon sand dunes that are formed on Titan uh, are, are concentrated at mid-latitudes and they're of the scale of um, uh, sand dunes here on Earth. It's really very fascinating and Earth-like. There's also, as I mentioned, weather. We witnessed with Cassini formation of clouds in springtime and rain. Um, and there, we know that there's swampy areas, um, especially at, at low and equatorial uh, latitudes. It's not water rain, though, of course. And these are not water lakes and seas that you see on the surface here. These, they're liquid hydrocarbons. So um, this is a radar map of the North Pole. And uh, it's false color. But there are, uh, are liquid hydrocarbons on the surface that make up lakes and seas. So it's, this is another thing that's very unique about Titan. This is the only place other than Earth where there's uh, stable liquids on the surface. But at these cold temperatures, it's about minus 290 Fahrenheit at the surface. Um, liquid is, or water is frozen, but hydrocarbons like methane and ethane are liquid. Um, and so 
there's hydrocarbon rain, there's, um, and there's also um, hydrocarbon lakes and seas. Fascinating and also very Earth-like. It looks like Earth. Here, um, and, um, you know, we, these were detected, these were discovered using uh, radar mapping like these, but the real smoking gun uh, came when we could really say, yes, these are liquid surfaces because we actually measured a glint um, with the infrared instrument off of one of these lakes, uh, just like we have here on Earth. When you're riding in a plane and you're looking down at the, the water and you get that glint at a particular geometry, this is exactly what um, uh, was measured um, by, by the Cassini mission at, at Titan confirming the presence of these liquid bodies on the surface. Really, really exciting. And this is what the surface actually looks like. So I mentioned the probe, it's the Huygens probe that went down through the atmosphere. And this is the, this, the image that we have of the surface of Titan from the surface of Titan. It's very orange, just like the atmosphere. And this again is because of all of that sedimentation uh, the complex organics coming down out of the atmosphere, they're orange. But the mainly, uh, the even more fascinating thing to me is that this, this looks like a riverbed uh, on Earth, right? So you, you can see the rocks there, which are surely uh, water, ice, uh, you know, rocks, probably about that big. Um, and they're kind of soft looking, like river rocks here on Earth look. They have been modified due to a fluid process. Um, so perhaps there was rain, perhaps there was a river there in the past, um, you know, kind of like we, we see the lakes in the um, northern latitudes. So Titan is very, very Earth-like. And we are going back <laughs> with the Dragonfly mission, which is due to be launched in 2017. And it's a very exciting mission because it will go to Titan and land, and it's a quadcopter. It's actually an octocopter because there's actually eight total rotors, and it will fly around. Um, it has a uh, power source, which is a radioisotope thermoelectric generator that will power it uh, out at those far distances from the sun. Um, it'll fly a few kilometers, do science measurements, um, power up its batteries, fly again, and uh, it's going to tell us all about the chemistry that's going on in those regions of Titan and tell us about the habitability. Um, I'm really excited about the Dragonfly mission. Stay tuned for this one um, in the early 2030s. So I hope I've started to convince you about how Earth-like and interesting Titan is. Let's review the Earth-like qualities. <laughs> it's got the atmosphere at just a little bit higher pressure than we have here on Earth. It's going to protect um, any living things on the surface from the radiation environment. Um, and also, if you were to go there, you would not need to wear a pressure suit, which is handy because they get bulky. Um, and um, it's low gravity. So if you go there, you and the atmosphere is dense. It's about five times denser than uh, our atmosphere here. So with the low gravity and the atmospheric density, you can just actually fly around under your own power, which would be really fun. Or, or you could take your own quadcopter or helicopter. Um, you can actually also um, take a boat and go rowing along in those um, lakes up at the high northern latitudes. There's a lot of challenges, of course. Uh, it's cold there, so you would have to definitely think about that. And there's no liquid water. There's no, uh, there's no liquid water, but you can make the water from the frozen water that's present. There's also no oxygen in the atmosphere to breathe. But you, again, you can make your oxygen out of the water that's present. Um, probably the biggest sticking point in my mind is how do you get there in a timely manner? Because you know, Cassini took seven years to get there. And if humans try to go out to Titan uh, and it takes seven years, then, then the radiation-free environment on the surface of, of Titan is kind of for naught. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I will look to my friends at Aerojet Rocketdyne and ULA to solve that problem. Or maybe some of you younger folks in the audience will think of something entirely new. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge uh, when we get there. There's lots of opportunities to make uh, energy to keep warm, um, lots of power opportunities. So it's just something fun to think about, I think, um, is how, how Titan can be habitable for humans. Um, but I will remind you, of course, that our, the most habitable, habitable place in the solar system is, is our own planet Earth, which is shown over here on the right um, in this beautiful image from Cassini. So that's the pale blue dot from, um, from the Saturn orbit. And, um, and we've got to keep, keep it habitable here, um, but then maybe go to Titan just for fun. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation and, and just the wonderful tour of some of these incredible places. Um, that's been the thing that's made the biggest impression on me as I've seen this exploration of the outer solar system is, is you get out there and we haven't known what we were going to see before we saw it. And each of these places has just been stunning. I mean, just, just you know, and not just as a scientist, but just beautiful locations. Uh, we have a bunch of questions uh, here online. Um, I'll start with the first one. When do you think that a lander will be sent to Europa to probe through the ice to look for microbial life in the ocean below? How would that kind of thing work? Right. That's a great question because that um, is a really great next step, I think. We, we've got a uh, clipper going. Clipper is going to do lots of Europa flybys and really tell us about that ocean and the habitability of the ocean and even we'll learn a lot more about the environment and the surface and the surface composition, the surface conditions. And then we can really understand what it would take. Uh, we have studied a lander quite a bit at Europa, but having clipper data will help a lot too. What it will take to put a lander on the surface, what's the best spot for it? You know, if you wanna drill through and get down to the ocean, you wanna pick the a good spot for it. Maybe some place that maybe isn't quite um, as a radiation intense environment. Maybe you can find some place that's a little shielded. Maybe you can find a place with a relatively thin uh, ice layer to get down to the ocean. Um, but that I think definitely is not too far off in the in the future is a Europa lander to, to in situ sense that ocean. Okay. I'll do one follow-up question online, and then I'll invite uh, folks to the uh, microphone here just behind the first uh, uh, group of seats in the room. When you're trying to get into an environment, an alien environment with liquid water, how do you protect that environment from oh. microbes that we might bring from the Earth? I know planetary protection <laughs> has been an interest of yours. Yep. yep. Right. That's a great point that I didn't bring up, is that if there is life at Enceladus, Europa, if there's some sort of crazy methane-based life at Titan, or maybe it doesn't have to be methane-based, maybe it can be liquid water-based. Um, if we wanna go there and find it, we don't want to be confounded by accidentally taking along Earth microbes on our spacecraft that survived the journey, and then we find those and say, oh my gosh, I found Europa life. Uh, because it's not clear that we would be able to distinguish terrestrial microbes that we brought along from any native microbial life um, that started up on any one of those worlds. So if we're really going there to try to detect life, look for biosignatures, um, we've got to take very careful measures to clean the spacecraft understand the community of um, bio burden, we call it, that might be on the spacecraft so that we can understand that, um, distinguish it from what we might um, actually discover when we're there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's planetary protection and it's very important. 
I, I know from our exploration of Mars, the, yeah. the big risk is taking a nuclear power source uh, onto an ice-rich area, crashing it and creating a warm puddle. The, the warm puddle concept is uh, uh, something that's really gotten a lot of attention in that space. Yeah, right. and, and that, that's where the time thing that I talked about comes in too, right? right? And proliferation. So even if the terrestrial microbes can survive there for a little while, if that puddle freezes up, maybe you're okay. Uh, if they, just so long as they can't get around and proliferate, maybe you're okay. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's, it's tricky. Okay. <laughs> what happened to Huygens after it took that photo of the surface? Huygens, it survived for 90 minutes or so on its battery power. And, and you know, it did a great job. <laughs> okay. It's still sitting there. I don't know, Dragonfly is not going to go anywhere near it, but maybe some other spacecraft will be able to find it. Yeah, but it was just battery powered. It, it, it wasn't necessarily intended to be a lander. It was a, an oh, atmospheric right, probe, right. but it just it it did survived its job. It, yep, it did its job great. Yeah. Um, so. we, we, uh, we have this, everybody understands the idea of jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. I've, I've never done it myself, and I probably won't. But with, with Titan, with this low gravity in this very cold, dense atmosphere, um, you, you, you come down on a parachute actually quite slowly. Right. And, and so that, that yep. allows you to do these kinds of soft landings without you know, quite the effort that it takes at a place like Mars with a thin right. atmosphere. It is a lot easier than Mars. But actually it's interesting because at Titan, it, um, it wasn't clear. You know, there was a good idea that there were going to be liquids, liquid hydrocarbons on the surface. And uh, there were models out there that predicted that maybe the whole entire surface of Titan is, is covered with liquid hydrocarbons. And so that probe was designed to be able to survive if it, even if it landed in liquid, because we didn't know if liquids were going to be present at those low latitudes. Um, and it turns out it didn't have to, but mm -hmm. you don't know until you get there. Right. Um, what circumstances allowed Europa to have a rocky ocean floor as opposed to an ice floor? I mean, you, you showed how yeah. important that is <clears throat> to create that chemistry that's needed to support life on an ocean world is to have, is to have uh, a rocky seafloor and, and hydrothermal activity uh, interacting with the water. What, what allows that to happen on a place like Europa? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think about how, you know, it has to do with the origin and formation of those moons. You're, um, the, the Jovian system, we like to think of as a, kind of a mini solar system, right? It kind of, the density gradient as you go out from the planet is um, kind of like we have in the solar system, where you have the rockier planets in close to the sun, and then more um, gas giants and more volatile rich planets and worlds in the outer solar system. So the rockier nature of, of Europa um, probably has to do with, you know, the formation uh, with more uh, dense, sort of um, maybe denser, rockier materials kind of condensing out and accreting and forming moons closer into the planet, and more volatile, heavy bodies in the outer part of the system. I think we have a question in the room. Uh, first of all, uh, wonderful talk. Uh, second thing is, I've grown up, you know, listening and understanding that these moons have like oceans under them or possibility of that. Right. First time I'm hearing about this like ice, ocean, ice situation. Mm. First of all, how did we discover that? And yep. second of all, how is that possible or how is that formed? Right, that's a great question. So how was it detected? So these oceans were detected um, by like, especially at uh, Ganymede and Callisto by um, the magnetometer measurements and the lucky situation with the Jupiter magnetic field being wobbly. But the uh, interior structure um, is gleaned, and these are models, but they're probably pretty good models because we understand what the interior structure is by gravity measurements from multiple flybys of these bodies and sensing uh, what the interior structure has to be to have a particular amount of pull on the spacecraft as sensed by the, um, um, the dishes on Earth. So the, dish, the um, deep space network on Earth is tracking the Galileo spacecraft as it's flying by any of these moons and sensing very 
sensitively its position and how its position might be altered from what uh, could be expected uh, based on the, the gravity and the interior structure of these bodies. So um, I guess I would say it's a mixture of modeling and gravity measurements primarily. Um, but what may have happened is perhaps in the past um, the ocean was a little thicker, the liquid layer was thicker, and then as time goes on and there isn't that warm rock to keep the liquid layer liquid, it kind of you know, gets more and more frozen and the liquid layer gets uh, thinner and thinner. Did I answer your, your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. okay, and we're at the top of the hour. We have one more question here in the room and that will uh, close us out for the night. Hi, with Enceladus being as tiny as it is and sort of like constantly outgassing liquid water, is there a chance that that water is all gonna boil mm. off in a few million years? Yeah. Are you gonna lose that? Uh, <laughs> luckily, no. <laughs> it's going to last for a long time. It won't be a few million years. Um, even though it's spewing out a lot of water, it, it'll go for quite a long time. But it is, you're right, it's a finite amount. And there's um, you know, calculations that you can do to determine how, how long it might go. Um, but interestingly, also, you can calculate um, how long the E-ring, you know, the E-ring, I, I didn't really ever get to say this, but it's sourced from the plume, from, which is sourced from the ocean of Enceladus, and it's just water, very, very, very little tiny water ice grains primarily. And they're like, you know, 5, 10, mic 20 microns, so very small. So they're colliding and they are, um, you know, disappearing at a pretty high rate. If there were no plume, that Enceladus E-ring would be gone in some 50 years. But the fact that it persists means that plume activity is, um, is persisting. And so, you know, we often think that if we can, if we can observe the E-ring from Earth, then that's a kind of a proxy way of understanding if the plume is still going. Because <laughs> everybody's like, is the, how variable is the plume activity? Is it ever gonna turn off for some reason? And we think, well, just so long as we see the E-ring still, we know that the plume is still going, or at least it was, you know, a few years ago. So, great question. Okay. Well, Dr. Amanda Hendricks, thank you very much for introducing us to this really fascinating and very dynamic region of the solar system, which has an incredible abundance of water and, and even a world that may be habitable for people. Uh, residents of the Washington, D.C. area are famously thin-skinned about the weather. You know, we, we like to complain whenever it goes up or down a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Titan is going to be a, a, a hard press for us, but uh, it, it's going to, but it, it's just an incredible place. Rivers and lakes of, of yep. liquid hydrocarbons, uh, you know, mountains and valleys, and, and a, an ocean beneath the surface. It's just incredible. Don't forget flying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, and, and, and thanks to all of you for, for joining us uh, both tonight and for the rest of the Exploring Space Lecture Series. Um, we really do appreciate the, the time you've taken to come and, and you know, spend the evening with us learning about these places of the solar system. Thank you to our sponsors, Aerojet Rocketdyne and United Launch Alliance, for making this uh, lecture series possible, and good evening. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.